everyone. Welcome back to Luncheon with the Experts, the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation program brought to you by Tercero Therapeutics. My name is Rain Bennett. I am your host. Happy to be here as always. And I've been working with the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation for almost a decade. I cannot believe it. And what I do, what I help them do is create video content that helps them achieve their mission, which is to spread awareness and, and education about neuroendocrine tumors. And we do that through produced video series as well as the live video series like the one you're watching today. So if you are a regular, if you're a friend of the foundation, a regular of the show, you know the drill, go ahead and let us know where you are signing on from in the world. We'd love to see how far this program reaches. And I'm blown away every week by someone chiming in from India or South Africa or Australia live, which is you know almost a whole nother day in some of those countries. So let us know where you are in the world. Say hello to your friends and community members. Before we get started, I just want to thank Tercera Therapeutics for their support of Luncheon with the Experts. Without them, we couldn't do this program. And we always have a, a quick disclaimer from them at the top of the program. We want to say that the opinions expressed by our guest presenter, as well as the questions asked by the audience, haven't been created or suggested by the sponsors. And CCF doesn't endorse or promote any of the views, opinions, or information, information provided in this presentation. Audience members, that's you all at home, should not rely solely on the opinions or information expressed by the guest presenter and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health or treatments. So that's a lot of words, but really the takeaway is that final sentence. We're gonna give you some great advice, some good, good uh, direction uh, for your journey, but we don't know your specific case. And by all means, take this information if it helps you back to your home team, your medical providers, and then discuss the next steps forward for yourself. So today we have uh, a special episode because our original guest, Dr. Halperin, is in Texas. And if you haven't watched the news this week, Texas, uh, whew, Texas is struggling. Um, so we've been talking with him this week, uh, starting Monday, and we were keeping an eye on it and it wasn't looking good. So we decided to like, let's postpone him. Uh, and I think hopefully, fingers crossed, he'll be back next week. And our next week's guest was kind enough and available enough to join us this week. So welcome, Dr. Philip Boudreau. How are you, Dr. Boudreau? I'm fine, thank you. We're just about thawed out here. Um, <laughs> our thoughts and prayers go out to the rest of the country that's still suffering under this bitter cold and all of the havoc that's now caused uh, at multiple levels and so yeah, absolutely um, we all got our fingers crossed that we get through this absolutely uh, without too much more suffering i know uh, I so know. i i feel for dr halpern and what he's going through there we we know what it's like to be without power not for a few days but for a few months so, i know you do i know you do so speaking of really with some of that so so for those who don't know uh where you where you're based and why that you're familiar with power being out for that long tell the folks that are that are attending uh, where you work, what you do, and, and your role as you see it in, in the neuroendocrine tumor community? Well, um, I guess you could call me a recovering transplant surgeon. Okay. My training, yeah. that's what my formal training was, and that's what I did for 20 years. Okay. Um, I work at Nolan Nets, New Orleans, Louisiana, neuroendocrine tumor specialist. I'm a professor of surgery in the Department of Surgery at Louisiana State University Health Sciences Center, and the former chairman of surgery at the Ochsner Kenner hospital, which is where we are located. Our program is a combined effort between LSU and Ochsner. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have participants from both those institutions as well as some community partners. So it really is a multidisciplinary, multi-institutional effort. Prior to this little weather problem we had called Katrina, which was about, I guess, close to a little over 15 years ago now, it's hard to believe. 50% of my time was spent doing neuroendocrine work, the other doing liver and kidney and pancreas transplants and all the stuff related to that. Mm -hmm. um, then that hurricane took out our hospital and our homes and a lot of things. I was working with Dr. Lowell Anthony and Dr. Gene Waltering, who are all carcinoid experts in their own right. We each had separate offices in separate locations around the city and separate clinics. And so when people wanted to see us, they had to make a trip, usually it was a two day effort to see three docs it's hard to get to two doctor's offices in the same day. If one of them orders a lab test or an x-ray, forget it, you'll miss the second appointment. So we all knew we wanted to be together in the same place at the same time. We would meet after work in the evenings on Tuesday nights and have our own ad hoc tumor board to figure out 
what we're going to do because those guys had given the first treatment of PRRT in this country, peptide receptor radiotherapy. They, they gave the first dose ever using high dose indium 111, which is the isotope used for the Octrea scan. Mm -hmm. And that worked. And so people were coming from all over the place to be candidates for that new therapy. And we had to figure out, was it the right therapy and the right time and what were we going to do and what their issues were. And sometimes they were not candidates for that therapy, but they needed an operation. They were turned down by a lot of centers saying they were no longer a candidate, but they asked me to take a look at them because I was a liver guy and they had liver problems and other things as well. And so um, what got my interest in carcinoid was the first hundred patients we saw, most of them were, well, they were all stage four disease about, I would say um, at least three fourths of them were on hospice or on pain patches or on some kind of um, downward spiral, you might say. Hmm. And after they got operated on them uh, and we were able to take care of their problem, 85% of them went home, got off a of hospice, went back to work, got off the pain patches and had pretty good outlook. And um, so that really piqued my interest. Now, this is a really different disease where you can really make a difference, even with patients with advanced disease, uh, which you can't always say for other types of tumors. And I guess because you have sometimes the luxury of time on your side with these being slow growing, you have time to formulate a plan, come up with a therapy and multiple therapies and then sequence those therapies. So the well, question is, if you can do 10 different things, which one are you supposed to do first? Absolutely. That's a big piece of it. That's why the multidisciplinary approach and all that. We, so we were doing that, but kind of on our own. Well, a, after that little storm thing, we took a hurricane to Baton Rouge and uh, I was able to borrow some clinic space from a surgeon friend of mine and my colleagues were willing to drive up to Baton Rouge from New Orleans couple of days a week, we'd have our first multidisciplinary clinic all together in the same place at the same time on the same day. And the docs went in and out and the patients stayed in the room. And we brought our nutritionists on board and we morphed our transplant coordinator, Pam Ryan, into our nurse navigator for neuroendocrine tumors. And that's what happened. That's how it was the nucleus of how it started. And then about a year later, we could get back to our home in New Orleans, but we had no clinic space available. Everything that was usable was taken. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't much. And there weren't very many operational hospitals yet at the time. But this institution was coming back online and I had some orthopedic friends. And they let me use their office on the days they operated. And we gave it, they gave us one exam room, a little 10 by 10 room. We had two picnic tables, two computers, a couple of phones for three docs, two nurses, a nutritionist, and somebody helped with the phones. And it said orthopedics over the door. And that was our multidisciplinary neuroendocrine tumor clinic. And people still came. And now fast forward, we're now in our own space of 7,500 square feet. We have 18 people in this office, including research personnel and all sorts of things and other specialists, gastroenterology, nuclear medicine, interventional radiology, pathology, you name it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're now following 4,000 active neuroendocrine patients, new patients we've seen since we came back to this institution and established NOLANETS. Uh, we've done over 2,000 operations on those patients, and we're seeing about anywhere between 50 and 100 new patients a month. Um, I, I never would have guessed that, that there were that many people with that big a need for the kind of help that a multidisciplinary center can offer. But mm -hmm. um, that's basically the Cliff's Notes version of how we got that's, here and what we do now. I, you know, that's the first time I, I, that I've heard that. I, lo I love that story. Um, as a side note, uh, unfortunately, I'm from the coast of North Carolina originally, so I, I know that terrible situation very well that hurricanes can bring. Uh, when I was younger in the 90s, uh, Hurricane Floyd, and more recently, um, Florence uh, in mm -hmm. 2018. But yeah, it is not it is not fun. But it's it's a it, bit of a helpless feeling uh, sometimes, really and uh, you know, so I can relate to patients when they have a helpless feeling and they don't know mm. what to do. That's we certainly point. didn't know what to do and whether we would be able to put this thing together. But out of something bad, we were able to actually cobble together something good on the ruins of that event. Wow. I um, love that. I love that part of the, that part of the story. That's a, that's I was a, very fortunate that, you know, mm -hmm. some people helped us along the way and gave us an opportunity and, uh, and, you know, we were able to all kind of put it together. So uh, we're very fortunate. Absolutely. So for those of you all uh, in attendance today, 
if you're not familiar and you should be because the folks at the at the Nolan Nets, first of all, are just all stars. And a lot of them are friends of the show and have been on the show. Pam Ryan, uh, Dr. Maluccio, Dr. Ramirez. Uh, I have been to this facility. It is amazing. Uh, one of our previous videos, not Lunch with the Experts, but our produced videos was on lung nets and diff neck. And we filmed it at the PRRT room that you have there, Dr. Boudreaux. And for those listening, it's, I mean, this facility is just amazing. It was so, um, I don't know what the word is, fulfilling, comforting to walk up to that wing and just see a, a whole wing for neuroendocrine tumor patients and see zebras everywhere. It was, you know, for someone like me, who's worked in, in this field for, for almost 10 years now, that was just such a, a great sight to see. So uh, everybody um, tuning in today, uh, first of all, go ahead and start sending in your questions. Now you know a little bit more about Dr. Boudreaux and, and what he specializes in, so you can send in your questions. And, and if you don't know the Nolan Nets team, which I think most of you probably do, you know we've got a great guest here today. So I'm going to ask uh, for, for some help from you at home. Here's two things I need from you. One, if you know someone that would benefit from this session, tag them in the comments or share the video right now to let them know it's happening and it's interactive and they can get questions uh, across to, to Dr. Boudreau today, uh, almost in person. It feels like it's in person. Uh, we can always refer back to the video. It will live here. So if they want to watch it like the, the recording, they certainly can, but there's a lot more benefit and value to being able to get in and learn uh, interactively and get your questions across. The second thing I'm going to need your help with, you all have been doing a great job of this every week. It really helps me do my job better, which is to, to help you. So it's also in your interest. If you see a question in the sidebar that you also have or that you're interested in the answer to, you'd like to learn more about, you can like that question or love it. There's a whole handful of reactions you can choose, but any of them that you choose, it will allow me to see that there is a demand for that question. It upvotes it essentially. And so then, because we get a ton of questions and inevitably we can't get to them all. So I see that a lot of people have that question. I will do my best to make sure that one, that I get that one across to Dr. Boudreaux. So you all have been doing a great job of that lately. Please keep it up. Just know if we don't get to your questions or you have follow-up questions, I encourage you to reach out to Carstone Cancer Foundation either here on the Facebook page, you can private message them, or you can also go to their website, uh, carcinoid.org, and send them a message there or send them an email. Uh, before we get started, we want to share with you that NANATS, the North American Neuro Neuroendocrine Tumor Society, has issued a position statement on COVID-19 vaccine for uh, neuroendocrine tumors, neuroendocrine carcinoma patients. Listen, this is something that comes up every week and you can still ask the question today, but I know that a lot of you all are concerned and have questions about this. So uh, we will post a link to, to the, um, so you can read that. We'll post a link so you can download the information for their position statement on that. I know a lot of you have that question. Uh, and before we get started, last question, have you downloaded CCF's free Net Cancer Health Storylines app? This app is awesome. It makes it easy to record your symptoms, medications, nutritional concerns, your moods, all of that. So if you haven't, check it out. We will also add a link to that in the comments. That being said, ladies and gentlemen, let's get the show started. Go ahead and start sending in your questions. Dorothy, I see Dorothy says, I thought you were canceled. Hello from Canada. No, we are not canceled. We are here. And that's a lot of, that's a big thanks to uh, Dr. Boudreaux, our guest today for making it possible. Uh, Dr. Boudreaux, so, well, let me ask you a couple of questions. You said uh, previously your uh, percentage of patients that had uh, neuroendocrine tumors was about 50%. Was that, was that what you said? Uh, well, accurate? about about half of my time was spent doing transplant work and the other half of my time doing neuroendocrine Oh, copy that. Copy that. How, so, and now is it a hundred percent of your patients? Pretty much 90%, I would say. 90%. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My, so, I hung up my transplant head. I still participate in organ donation and organ recovery efforts and take call to do that about one week out of three. Mm -hmm. uh, but the rest of my daytime job is still neuroendocrine stuff. Now, uh, I've had a couple of questions over the, over the past few months about this. I'd like to, to ask you a little bit about the role that, transplantation you know plays in this disease specifically is mm -hmm. it something someone can pursue if so when and why and how that, that question the... that question comes up a lot actually indeed, and indeed. so let me give you a little backstory on transplantation so Please. back in the 80s when people had metastatic cancer that spread to their liver from the colon from the pancreas from the lung from the breast from anywhere 
and they were overburdened with tumors in the liver and we thought we couldn't remove them all. We said, well, let's just remove the liver, put a new one in and we'd be good to go. Well, that experiment was unfortunately a very, a very big failure hmm. because patients that had those kinds of tumors, although they had macro disease or big visible disease in their liver, what we didn't appreciate was the microscopic the disease they had elsewhere in their body that we couldn't see. So when we immunosuppress them, which you have to take anti-rejection medicines basically for the rest of your life to prevent rejection of the liver or the kidney or the heart, or whatever organ you're talking about, um, it was like putting gasoline on a fire. And the metastases that were invisible before would sprout up and explode. And these patients quickly succumbed within a few weeks to months of widespread cancer all over their body. So we said, okay, moratorium on transplants for cancer. And the only kind of cancer we figured out liver transplant was good for was if you had primary cancer of the liver that started in the liver and never got to the liver from somewhere else and stayed in the liver and didn't leave the liver, was still in the liver at the time of transplant. Hmm. And there are several criteria to determine that that's where you're at. Then we started pushing the envelope. We said, what about neuroendocrine tumors? So they're slow growing, they're slow to metastasize. They really don't act like other types of tumors. And so people started working with that and reopening that question and started doing transplants for people that had neuroendocrine tumors where if their only side of disease was in the liver, they would get a liver transplant. And the majority of those patients did quite well if they had a slow growing type of tumor that had what's called a low KI67 index, which is a when you make a slide of a biopsy of a tumor and you stain it with this KI67 stuff, basically it tells you what percentage of the cells are actively dividing when you made the slide. If that number is 10% or less, most people will now consider it a reasonable thing to consider transplantation if the only site of disease is in the organ you're talking about transplanting, typically the liver. Then a couple of folks, some people in Indiana and some people in, in Miami in particular, started asking the question, well, Suppose they have tumor wrapped around the base of the mesentery and wrapped around the blood supply to the intestines, and we can't get that out. And they also may have some stuff in their liver as well. But if we took that whole thing out and removed all of that visible disease, remove the intestines, remove the pancreas, remove the stomach, and remove the liver, and put in a whole new set on block from the donor, from the same donor, all in one shot, it's called a multivisceral organ transplant, or MVOT for short. How would that work? And so they started doing that. And sure enough, that works actually pretty well uh, in a considerable number of occasions. But again, the criteria are, and before we didn't know this, whether the mitotic index would be a big deal, the, mm -hmm. that KI-67. So we transplanted them all and found out the hard way that people that had a higher, more aggressive, faster growing tumor did more like the other people that had these other kind of cancers and had early returns. So that sort of lowered the threshold of who should be a candidate. But if the, if the transplanting institution can think they can remove all disease at the time of operation and it's confined to one body cavity like the abdomen, then those people are sometimes considered for a multivisceral organ transplant, but then they have to have a bunch of other criteria because it's a rather formidable operation, a bit of a tour de force. So they have to have a good heart, good lungs, good kidneys, a fairly robust physiology to be able to withstand the rigors of a transplantation. Although we have sent them some patients that were really, really in a bad way because they had intestinal failure, their livers weren't working too well. And once they got the transplant, everything turned around and they really became basically cured. Wow. So um, it is a remarkable turnaround when it really works, but it doesn't always work. So mm -hmm. there's like with everything, there's a the risk benefit ratio. And that's pretty well worked out. It's, it's, it's up to the transplanting center and the transplanting surgeon and the whole team to assess the patient. Are they optimized with all their other nutritional parameters, everything else that goes into getting through this operation and being able to handle the rigors of the immunosuppression afterwards and all that stuff. But I have to tell you, because I'm a, I am a transplanter and I've seen what transplantation can do and now it can really turn someone's life around from being moribund to being a fully productive and full-time employed human being and, you know, enjoying their family and their friends and their, get their life back. It's a pretty remarkable thing. But uh, there are a lot of things that can be done short of a transplant with this particular entity uh, with neuroendocrine tumors so that where we can many times affect a, 
pretty dramatic turnaround in patients that have otherwise been, you know, struggling. Mm. Uh, and so again, it's, it's really an individualized therapy is the whole key. It's a, definitely a team approach. Uh, we are very fortunate to have to, been able to cobble together a pretty robust team here. Everybody from the people who keep the hospital clean all the way up to the CEO are all, they're all on board. And kind of, awesome. if you, if you, if you go outside and drive around the parking lot, the, uh, the parking lot is rather large and there's little streets and lanes. And so <laughs> one of them is named the zebra lane. That is awesome. I, I've been in the parking lot, but I, I, I didn't uh, I didn't see that. That's really cool to know. Um, well, I'm really interested in the topic of transplantation. I could probably talk to you for the whole hour, but it's not about me today. So I'm going to start. Uh, maybe we'll get some questions about it, but I'm going to shift to some questions from the audience because I see them, them coming in. We got great numbers here today. Uh, uh, Karen, Karen says hello from New, uh, Auckland, New Zealand, where it's 6 a.m. Friday morning. See what I mean? Oh, my gosh. Right. Hi, Harrison. Karen, uh, well, <laughs> I'm Thank glad you. you're willing to get up early, and I hope. Well, you must be in summertime over there, I suppose. Yeah, but uh, so hopefully we're doing a good job. Uh, so anyway, let's get to some questions. Linda says, "When and and several people have this question: When and why is chemo chemoembolization used instead of radiofrequency ablation for carcinoid tumor metastases in the liver?" Okay, that's a great. Um, question that was from linda linda yes linda well thank you and thank you for that question that's a really good one we get that one a lot around here and sometimes we have trouble picking the right answer but the short answer is radio frequency ablation is done one at a time where you stick basically a needle-like probe affair into a tumor and whether it's radio frequency ablation or now what we're using is microwave ablation which is a similar idea it's just a different frequency but it's a it's basically a microwave antenna you stick into the tumor, you turn on the juice on the machine over there and fire it up and it, it cooks the tumor like you cook an egg in the microwave. Mm -hmm. And the sphere of influence is de de defined by how much energy you apply to the probe and over how much time. And so the longer the time you cook, the bigger the sphere you cook. The problem with that is it kills with heat. There's things sometimes in the liver or in other places that you're trying to cook that you don't want to destroy. You don't want to have collateral damage to major blood vessels or bile ducts, for instance, in the liver. So one of the rate limiting steps is like real estate, location, location, location. If that structure is too close to a big blood vessel, actually what happens is the high blood flow through that big vessel acts like a heat sink and cools the tumor where it's close to the vessel so you don't get complete killing. It doesn't cook it enough. Conversely, if you cook it enough to kill it completely, you might cook the blood vessel as well. And then you may have hurt the blood supply to a major portion of the liver. Or more, more commonly, you cook a bile duct and you now damage the liver where bile can't get out of the liver very well and you get jaundice and can have some liver problems. So mm -hmm. that's the one piece. The second piece is typically this ablation technique where you're trying to cook a tumor doesn't work for things that great beyond about three centimeters. So that's about about yay big. So a centimeter is maybe the width of your little fingernail. So tumors much bigger than that are hard to cook adequately. If you have multiple little small tumors, you'd be cooking so many little things you'd be cooking all day. And the problem is the collateral damage and the heat would destroy a lot of good liver. So typically the, the liver directed therapy, we call it, where you go in an artery in the leg or the wrist, mm -hmm. you feed it up with the aorta and out the main artery to the liver, and then try and feed it into the arteries that are feeding the tumors. You can shoot stuff into small stuff that way and get a whole bunch of them in one shot. Usually you typically would do one side of the liver, let the liver recover, come back a few legs later, get the other side if there's stuff on both sides. And then usually you take a third pass and take a little touch up to see if there's any few that you need to hit again. And the idea is when you do this chemoembolization, they call it, or liver direct therapy. Sometimes people lace it with chemotherapy. Sometimes they just lace it with some clotting agent that just plugs the vessel and cuts off the blood supply of the tumor to choke it to death and it's, it basically dies of starvation. Well, either way, the, um, the, the problem with that is, is that that doesn't work really great for super big tumors sometimes. Uh, and so sometimes really big tumors, the best answer is just go take them out. Um, and again, that's why a multidisciplinary approach of looking at how much burden is the liver 
you know, undergoing and how much tumor burden in general, uh, if less than 50% of the liver is occupied with tumor and they're not considered candidates for surgical resection, chemoembolization is usually the route that's chosen. Um, if it's more than 50% of the liver is occupied with tumor, you have to be very careful and selective how you embolize parts of the liver. And you may have to do it fractionally a little bit at a time because the liver is not going to have the horsepower to withstand a big blast where you take one whole half the liver out, uh, at least temporarily. It recovers from that. But while the liver is kind of sick from this, you could be kind of in a bad way. So uh, again, it's, um, it's a question of degree and how much is enough and how much is too much. Sure. And that's why it really has to be, I think, individualized and really look at the whole picture of what's been done to the liver previously. Have there been other interventions, other embolizations, other ablations? Uh, we're really nervous about people that have gotten previous radioactive microsphere embolization, tiny little microscopic beads that are shot up into the liver. And they were considered then doing some type of liver directed therapy after that, because we're now learning that some of the long-term effects of those radioactive beads can be really injurious to the, the healthy liver and can sometimes even lead to cirrhosis of the liver. You know, the tumor is not the issue. It's the liver that's now hurt from the high dose of radiation that received sometimes years before. Hmm. But the problem is years ago, that's all we had. And so, again, sometimes when your only tool is a hammer, you know, the whole world can look like a nail. Indeed. And so, fortunately, now we have a lot of different tools in our toolbox. Uh, and so the radioactive microsphere is only reserved for specific targets where you have maybe one large tumor in the liver that you can't remove, but you want to ablate it. It's too big to cook with the microwave or the radio frequency, too big to embolize with maybe chemoembolization, but you may want to blast it with high dose radiation just to that one spot without involving the remainder of the liver. So those, it's kind of a long answer to a short question, but. <laughs> no, that was thorough. Thorough was good. Uh, thank you, Linda, for your question. Uh, Dr. Boudreau, next question from Wendy. Wendy says, I'm a PNET with metastases. I felt so much better after, uh, whip, after her Whipple, um, but after a year I've been diagnosed with carcinoid syndrome and heart disease. Mm -hmm. non-peptide receptor positive, do mm -hmm. I need octreotide protocol? Oh, there's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, it would be really interesting to see uh, how you could have carcinoid heart disease with, I'm assuming, high serotonin levels as a reason. Mm -hmm. um, in general, we recommend octreotide coverage for perioperative procedures on any patient. Uh, that goes to the operating room, even if they're negative on their gallium scan. Um, and it may be they just don't have enough receptor density to light up on a scan. Mm -hmm. But we think that the, the, the downside of having a carcinoid crisis during the middle of something like, say, heart valve surgery, way outweighs the risk of high-dose octreotide infusion intraoperatively. So we would recommend it. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, We've got a question from Gina it says undifferentiated versus differentiated cells. Each lymph, lymph node showed one type. Can you explain the difference? Well, the pathologists, when they look at tissue on slides, they say, does it look a lot like the parent cell they think it came from? And does it look kind of like a normal cell? There are just too many of them mm -hmm. and growing in a bad place where they shouldn't be. So that would be like we would call well differentiated. Sometimes over time, as they repl replicate, 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 divide, 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 and do their thing, that's all they know how to do is make more of themselves. They lose their way. And they lose their differentiation, so they don't look like the parent cell anymore. They look a little more where it's hard to tell what it, looked, what it originally was because it doesn't look like the parent anymore. It just it. has this nondescript, what they call undifferentiated or poorly differentiated because it just looks like a some kind of cancer cell mm -hmm. that doesn't look enough like the parent cell to tell you this is a X, lung cancer, colon cancer, whatever. So, um, and the, the less differentiated it becomes and the more what they call anaplastic or poorly differentiated, typically it's harder to treat. That's what, yeah, that's what I was gonna ask next. That's the thing. 
and and the more de-differentiated it looks and the more poorly differentiated it looks you're leaning towards more classic chemotherapy type interventions rather than the types of therapy that are reserved for neuroendocrine tumors got it and so and then there's also of course in the chemotherapy world there's all degrees of that and so that's where a little bit of the art comes in deciding how much is enough de-differentiation to warrant heavier, more, more um, aggressive chemotherapy versus some of the less types of chemotherapy we have that we can use for patients with neuroendocrine tumors. So it makes a difference in the therapy yeah. down the road. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. That, that, that was a very clear explanation. That I, mean, I, I learned a lot of that too. And thank you, Gina, for your question. You know what? I like what you said about the, that's when it brings in the art of it. And I would ha- let me know if you agree with this, but I would have to think that to make those decisions, I like how you worded that, you know, a patient would need someone, one, first of all, someone with a lot of experience can, can make those, you know, art, those art of it calls. But I also think that that shows the importance of having a multidisciplinary team of having a specialist who really knows this disease to be able to make those calls that aren't so black and white that you have to kind of lean on experience. Is that, is that fair to say? And unfortunately that is a big part of it. Yeah. Um, the, there's no really good book of rules to go look up a lot of this stuff in just yet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Some of those um, guidelines and things of course are written, but they're still just guidelines and sure. And they don't apply to the individual patient necessarily, especially if the patient's physiology, the book says we should do this and this ought to happen. Well, this doesn't, you did this, but that right. didn't happen. Something other, unexpected what? happened. The key is how to deal with the unexpected. Mm-hmm. There's the rub. And that's where experience really comes in. So, oh, I've seen this before. I know what'll work because we know that because we know that didn't work. We know we have to do this other thing to get where we want to be. Absolutely. Um, and the management of a critically ill patient in the ICU in the perioperative period after, say, heart valve surgery that has full-blown carcinoid syndrome is a really tricky business. And so you really don't have to know how to manage the octreotide drips, how to manage the pressors, which in general you try to avoid and use non-pressors, uh, other types of supportive things to help support blood pressure and all those things when people are having very labile issues. Uh, and so that's that's kind of a kind of an important thing to have mm-hmm. those kinds of major operations, whether they're liver resections or heart surgery operations or stuff like that in patients, especially with carcinoid syndrome, in a center that's used to taking care of those kinds of patients. And, and folks, I mean, this is a topic that comes up every week, multidisciplinary teams. We've even created a, a one of our produced videos, which you can find on the videos tab here on the Facebook page or on our YouTube channel about multidisciplinary teams and the importance of that. So that's it's crucial, to, I think, to to seek that out. And that's why programs like Nola Nets are, are, are really great at what they do. And this is just a topic that comes up all the time uh, for those just joining us. Um, uh, we've got about half half of the episode left, about 30 minutes. And I see Fred ask, is this the program scheduled for Thursday, February 18th? Uh, if you're joining us now or joining us a little bit late, uh, we are live today with Dr. Philip Boudreau, who was an, initially supposed to be our guest for next week, but due to the storms in Texas, um, not uh, uh, allowing Dr. Halperin to safely get to his office. And I think power is still out and it's it's things are really rough for them down there. We were able to switch last minute. So if there's any confusion about our announcements that we put throughout the week, uh, that's the cause of it. But by uh, judging off of the numbers of people in attendance, uh, it hasn't slowed us down one bit. So it's looking like uh, we've got a lot of great people out there tuning in today. Um, All right, moving on, Dr. Boudreau. So Jennifer says, after PRRT, some patients experience low white slash red blood, uh, blood cell counts. A follow-up series may not be recommended because of this. Would a blood or bone marrow transfusion be possible or recommended if the count drops too low? Uh, so yes, your, your question is about one of the rare side effects of PRRT, peptide receptor radiotherapy, basically giving her a radioactive drug that binds to the tumor like a guided missile to go cook it off. Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes that radiation affects the bone marrow. And so the bone marrow has a hard time making enough white blood cells or red blood cells or platelets or sometimes all of the above. 
um, in most cases, it's a transient effect. And if you wait long enough, the counts will recover, but sometimes it's not and it's permanent. And so sometimes patients, when their counts go low enough, they have to have platelet transfusions to minimize the risk of spontaneous bleeding or blood transfusions because they get so anemic. We don't usually give people white blood cell infusions because, uh, well, we used to do that back in the day. I, I'm dating myself now when they, people got really low white blood cell counts from chemotherapy. And we thought, oh man, their counts are so low and they have an infection. Let's give them some white blood cells to help fight the infection. The problem is the white blood cells you give them are not their own. And those white blood cells don't know that they're not supposed to hurt the person that you put them in. So they go after everything. And sometimes they would actually hurt the host mm. more than they would hurt the infection. So we don't do that. Anymore. That's not a, not a great idea. So you just have to wait for the white blood cell counts to recover. And there are sometimes medications that can help some growth factors and stuff that will sometimes help stimulate the growth and recovery of the bone marrow to get the cells back where they ought to be. Got it. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for your question. Next question from Karen. And it seems a few others have this question as well. What is the best scan to detect carcinoid tumors? My wife's oncologist uh, only has her have CT scans. And I worry that this isn't the best to detect them. Um, she has constant abdominal pain and carcinoid syndrome. Any thoughts on that? Sure. Um, well, thank you for that question. And we actually struggled with this for quite some time. Um, the best scan to detect tumors to see if there's live tumor around currently is going to be either a gallium 68 PET scan or a copper 64 PET scan. Copper 64 is kind of the new kit on the block. That's yeah. I it's so. a little more stable isotope. It's easier to handle and deal with. And um, it's probably going to replace the gallium in the not too distant future. That's just my guesstimation. It, how Mainly available because, is that as of now? I'm sorry. How available is it? It is now commercially available. It is FDA approved. Awesome. And yes. And so it is It's just a much easier isotope to deal with, to handle, to prepare. When you do a gallium scan, you basically have to make the gallium on site, bind it to the binding agent on site or nearby because it's got a short half-life. And then you've got to get it into the person and then get them in the scanner and do the picture before the stuff all goes poof and evaporates. Got it. Got it. The copper hangs around a little longer, and it's even a little bit less of a dose of radiation than the gallium. But it's how you got a little more wiggle room. If somebody's late for their appointment, yeah, uh, there's traffic or whatever, they can't get to the scanner or whatever. You, you you don't waste the chance to get a good image. So, for finding stuff now, for for following and assessing disease progression and determining. Just what is the volume of disease, let's say, in the liver? We have found that the MRI is a much better scan to evaluate the liver than a CT scan. We have had patients that had a CT scan that was essentially normal. You think there's, man, there's not much there. Hmm. And then you do an MRI scan, you find 50 tumors. Wow. Now, before the gallium scan, and when we use the octrea scan, the MRI was the most sensitive thing we had to figure out what was going on in the liver because the problem with the with the Octrea scan, which is an indium-based isotope, the liver sucks up so much of that stuff that it's so bright and hot, it overshadows everything that would otherwise show up. The gallium is a little better at finding stuff in the liver because the normal liver doesn't light up so hot as the tumors, and so it's easier to see stuff in the liver with a gallium scan or a copper scan, but it's not a great tool for assessing size. And, you know. In the surgeon's mind, we have, to know, we have to know size, we have to know location, we have to know proximity to blood vessels, bile ducts, and all that stuff. That all goes into the decision of saying, is this something that's approachable, gettable, and can we get it out? If you think about it, the way a gallium scan works is, if you have a tumor, it could be a small tumor, and you give a molecule that's got a light bulb on the end of it, and a whole bunch of light bulbs go and stick to that tumor, and now you take it, you look at it in the dark, it's hugely bright white light. And you think it's a train coming. <laughs> okay. But it's actually a little bitty thing the size of a garden pea that's just a big white spot on the ectoplasm. So the brightness of the spot doesn't tell us much about size. And so when we really want to make more precise measurements about stuff like that, we have to use the MRI currently, especially for assessing the liver. Other parts of the body, the CT scan works really great. 
especially the chest yeah. and the other parts of the abdomen and so forth like that. But for some reason, a lot of times these tumors are what we call isodense. That means that the, the X-ray, the CT scan, which is done with X-ray images, can't tell the difference between tumor and normal liver. It looks all bland, looks kind of all the same. Even with, con even with contrast and stuff, it doesn't stand out very much. Mm -hmm. You're looking for differences in perfusion and penetration of how much radiation goes through different tissues to say, is there something there, is there not? With MRI, it's a magnetic resonance, so it uses magnets, not even any radiation involved. So that's another reason to probably you'd rather do that, besides the fact that it's just a better quality picture and you just see more stuff. The problem with all that jazz is the perfect scan that tells us everything that's going on in a person from top to bottom hasn't been invented. Um, I live about half my life in plan B. We get all these scans, we get all these images, we get all this stuff done, we go to the operating room with a plan because the x-ray says, this is what we're gonna find. We get in there and we find something different. Mm -hmm. Just the way it is. I mean, just the perfect scan hasn't been invented yet that tells you everything you wanna know about what's going on inside a person. So far, the best scan uh -huh. has been the eyeball scan and the hand scan where you put your hand in there and feel around and look and see exactly what's what. The good thing is, is that a lot of times we have plan B, C, D, and E in their pocket, because sometimes even plan B is not going to work. So that's kind of where experience counts for these kind of things and what to do with unexpected findings in the operating room so you can still do a thorough job of what needs to be done, you know, to get the mission accomplished. Absolutely. Uh, folks, you, you see that we, we're kind of swimming around the same themes, you know, seeking out a... a medical provider, so a specialist who has this experience, a multidisciplinary team. So that's, that's very important with it, with this disease. We keep, you know, each, each answer kind of keeps coming back to that. And Dr. Boudreau, I got to say, like, I love how you explain things visually. That's so helpful for people, you know, like me, who I've, I've been working in the disease for a while, but I'm not certainly nowhere near an expert, but that, that's just really, you know, people, people see things, th things through images. And so, uh, like your metaphor with the, you know, the train light. I mean, that was just perfect. So I just wanted to commend you for that because it makes it really easy to grasp. So it's clear that you have that experience. Um, Lynn asks, is there a blood test that can predict and detect in nets? Well, and that's a good question. There are, there are some tests out there that are um, being looked at. Uh, one is called net detect is the one I'm familiar with mm -hmm. uh, that looks for a lot of molecular markers. Um, to see if there's something that is going on there. Uh, there are some sort of screening tests that we do if you're looking for things these tumors make. Mm -hmm. um, so- Like serotonin? Serotonin. Yeah. Um, the compounds we look at are primarily pancreastatin, which seems to be one of the common denominators for most neuroendocrine tumors, with the exception of lung noise that don't seem to make anything sometimes. Sometimes they will, lung bronchial carcinoids will make hormones that can cause a syndrome of one kind or another, and those can be detected. Mm -hmm. uh, but the majority of a lot of these normal endocrine tumors oftentimes are silent. They don't make stuff that causes a physiologic effect or some syndrome or some constellation of symptoms because of some chemical hormone-like substance. Pancreastatin doesn't cause any symptoms. It's a piece of a thing called the chromogranin molecule, which used to be the one we everybody used. And that was the ubiquitous marker people use for looking for neuroendocrine tumors, wow. chromogranin A. The problem with chromogranin A is there's a whole bunch of stuff that can falsely elevate your chromogranin A level. If you're taking a bunch of PPIs, the proton pump inhibitors, the purple pill, Asifex, Protonix, Pepsin, uh, Nexium, all that kind of stuff for people that have reflux and dyspepsia and acid stomachs and all that stuff that people take for years, when those drugs were invented, it was designed to take for six weeks and get over your acute problem and quit. Mm. Because people feel good on them, they take them forever. Wow. Well, for whatever reason, that seems to cause sometimes a reflex, because it's so good at lowering stomach acid, it causes a reflex elevation in a hormone called gastrin, which the stomach makes when it detects, hey man, I don't have enough acid, give me some more acid. So it makes gastrin. Gastrin is a hormone that's the turn on switch that tells the stomach, make some more acid, come on, man get with the program. Um, and so what happens is that gastrin is a trophic substance for the what's called the enterochromaffin cells, these little carcinoid precursor cells that line the whole gut. And there's a bunch of them in the stomach and they start to grow and proliferate a little bit and they start making a bunch of chromogranin. And so people get all worried that they got 
carcinoid tumor because they have elevated chromogranin levels. But if you stop that proton pump inhibitor, that anti-acid drug, after about three months, the levels go back down to normal. Everything's hunky-dory. You have to use a different kind of anti-acid if they have really big challenges with carcin with um, stomach acid problem like reflux and stuff. Got now, it. people that have a condition called type 1 gastric carcinoids used to be called pernicious anemia. It's also called autoimmune gastritis. Mm. These people, unfortunately, have antibodies against the acid-forming cells in their stomach. It's an autoimmune disease. They sometimes have other symptoms of autoimmune things. They sometimes have type 1 diabetes, or they have vitiligo, a condition where they lose the pigment in their skin, mm -hmm. or sometimes thyroid problem. Anyway. The problem is they kill all the acid producing cells in the stomach. They get a reflex sky high production of gastrin because the stomach says, man, where's my acid? Or, or gastrin, Scotty. You get it really cranking to get that, trying to get some more acid, but no acid comes. And so these people, the promopin cells in the stomach start to grow because gastrin is like a growth factor for those things. And they get a bunch of little cobblestone carcinoid tumors all over the stomach. Sometimes a lot of them can get really big and become autonomous and act like a full on carcinoid cancer. Mm -hmm. Fix sometimes is just take out the gastrin factory of the stomach, which is called the antrum. The gastrin levels normalize, and then the carcinoid tumors kind of melt away. That's a specific kind of carcinoid where markers are very helpful to figure out kind of what's going on. Got it. Thank you. And thank you, Len, for your question. Uh, folks, we uh, got about 15 minutes left, so get your questions in. We're going to keep chugging forward, but really quickly, I got to make note of you know you have a great guest when at the three quarter mark of an hour show, we're at the highest number of attendees we've had. We're at 100, over 150 people of you out there right now. We're so grateful for that. And if I can be so bold to, to, to say, maybe that's a sign of a good show too, because most of the time with these video programs, the curve starts, well, I'll do it for you all, starts high at the very beginning, the first minute, and then it get you know dwindles down for the people, only the true fans who can stay. And ours is going up as we go on. That's a good sign, ladies and gentlemen. And all the hearts and likes emojis are coming in now <laughs> as I pander to the audience for claps. Uh, next, question from, <laughs> next question from Nelia. Nelia, I hope I'm pronouncing your, your name correctly. Doctor, is there, a specific, is there a specific heart doctor to see if you have NETS? So the question is about how it affects the heart potentially. My understanding is NETS can drive blood pressure, pressure high and can damage the heart. Well, Nelia, thank you for that question. So the, the condition we see, some patients do have elevated blood pressures as a result of their neuroendocrine tumors. Um, and then some people just have high blood pressure because they have high blood pressure. So Hypertensive heart disease is one thing. It causes thickening and enlargement of the heart because the heart has to really squeeze against that head of pressure to move some blood around against the back pressure of high blood pressure. But carcinoid heart disease is a specific thing typically caused by high serotonin levels, which is a, the stuff that causes the flushing, the diarrhea, the sometimes the wheezing and palpitations that are associated with carcinoid syndrome. Mm -hmm. And you can have any or all or none of those symptoms and still have carcinoid heart disease. The serotonin affects people different ways. Not everybody gets affected the same, but we do know that people that have a high serotonin level for a long enough time, it starts to destroy the valves in the heart and they get leaky. And so now they, they, where it's supposed to be a one-way valve and keep the blood going through the heart, instead it starts backing up every time the heart beats and the heart gets overfilled with blood and can't empty properly. And so it's always struggling to try and push the blood forward, but someone's going backward. And so then that causes back pressure. It starts to get, then you start having swelling in the legs, sometimes swelling in the abdomen. And then the back pressure, sometimes the liver doesn't work so good from that. Uh, and basically you need to have your valves replaced before you can have your carcinoid syndrome fixed because now the heart, fail, it, it leads to heart failure. And then you get too much fluid accumulating, the body can't pump it around to the kidneys to eliminate it. So, We've had some patients that had to have their valves fixed before we could go fix their livers and their intestinal problems and all the other things that was going on from the tumor in their belly. So um, a cardiologist would be the person to do a cardiac echo, which is an ultrasound picture of the heart to look at the valves. And we recommend in patients with carcinoid syndrome, you get an annual cardiac echo as part of their routine follow-up to see how the valves are doing. Because you never know who's gonna have a valve problem and who's not and at what time course because people live a long time, well, hopefully. And so you may live long enough to get carcinoid heart
heart disease, whereas that used to be the leading cause of death in people with carcinoid syndrome before we had octreotide. Wow. Once octreotide came along, then that we were able to get control of the serotonin levels and lower those down. And so not so many people got carcinoid heart disease as they used to. They have other problems now. They live long enough to have liver problems and gut problems that we have to then address, you know, typically surgically and so forth. What about the tumors themselves potentially moving to the heart? Is that something that happens? It, uh, with one of our it, attendees. It said. does happen. It does happen. It's rare. And we probably have a dozen or so, maybe two dozen patients that have tumors actually in the musculature of the heart. Wow. But the interesting thing about that, they're really scary looking when you see them on a scan. Mm -hmm. You say, oh man, look at that. But they don't seem to cause a problem, which is a good thing. Hmm. How, how do you approach that? At this point in time, we basically using all of our agents in our disposal to suppress them. Mm -hmm. We use, you know, somatostatin analogs like octreotide, lanreotide. We use other things. Uh, sometimes we use PRRT. Uh, we have not had to take a patient to the operating room to remove a tumor from the heart. We have just not run into that as being an issue or a problem. Mm -hmm. And so we really didn't see these things in the heart. They probably had been there all along, but now that we have really good MRIs that can scan the heart during the heartbeats, before you couldn't see anything because it was always a blur. Uh, and we have the gallium scan and copper scan and stuff like that. We're picking up stuff in the heart that we didn't know was there before. Probably been there all along in a lot of patients, but it doesn't seem to be causing any much of a, if you pardon the pun, heartache. Mm. Okay. Which is good. Yeah, yeah. So. Absolutely. Um, you know, when we first gave our first treatment of PRT to a patient that had one of these in the heart, uh -huh. we were really worried because we didn't know, suppose that tumor dies and ruptures, are they going to blow a hole in their heart? Right. And so we had to think long and hard about before we do it when first PRT first came out. Turned out they did fine and had no issues, and that's not a, that's not a problem to ever have to worry about. Gotcha. We've okay. given a lot of PRT to people with that Copy since that. then, with, and they did fine. Good to know. Next question from Mary. How concerning is elevated chromogranin level if tumors are stable? Well, Mary, that's a really good question. That's why one of the reasons we don't use chromogranin that much anymore, although sometimes, depending on where one is, that's the only marker one can get. Um, we look at changes in levels of more than what the absolute number is. So rising levels, and the one we look at more commonly than chromogranin is pancreas statin. It's a more stable molecule. Like I said, people that are taking uh, acid-reducing drugs for their stomach have elevated chromogranin levels. People that have a little bit of kidney insufficiency will have elevated chromogranin levels, or liver problems will give you elevated chromogranin levels. There's about 20 different things that can falsely elevate the chromogranin A levels, which is why we don't use it as much. Although if that's the only marker we have, then that's the one we go with. As long as the markers are stable, then we figure, okay, we're copacetic, things are holding, when they're starting to rise and double and, you know, markedly elevate over time, then we say, okay, we better do some investigating and see what's going on. Is there some progression somewhere that we need to go address? Gotcha. We typically do markers every three months and do imaging and scanning every six for surveillance. Copy that. Thanks, Mary. Uh, Margaret, why is net cancer un unable to be considered in remission as opposed to other cancers? Once the tumors have spread to the messenger's uh, messenger lymph nodes, but all tumors have been surgically removed. <laughs> That's a really good question. Mary. Yeah, a lot of people um, have that question too. I get that question a lot. And um, I guess you could say a person is in remission if they have no evidence of disease for a long period of time. The question is, we don't know how long is long. Uh, with other types of tumors, you know, we usually consider somewhere three to five years of no evidence of disease is remission. Uh, we've had patients that have, their disease has come back after, you know, 10, 15 or 20 years. It's rare and it's odd that it'll show up someplace else where it wasn't quite evident before. Typically what happened is they weren't really followed very closely. And the next time they get followed was maybe 10 or 15 years after their last episode of whatever. Um, and then, oh, look at that. Where did that come from kind of thing? Mm -hmm. So um, with these slow-growing things, it's really hard to say when is, you know, when is, when is it finished? Um, probably at the 10-year mark, 
99.9% of patients that have no evidence of recurrence are considered in remission and are quote cured. Um, they will still probably be followed because you still, we won't know what the future holds till we get there. But um, I don't know what the magic number is and nobody really knows if it's somewhere between five and 10 years. But um, for certainly we think because of the, the slow insidious nature of this disease, it's sneaky. It's just real sneaky. And so certainly less than five years, we probably just kind of say, well, nothing looks, you know, everything looks good, but we don't come out and say remission just yet. Yeah. Probably more our own insecurity than what the real situation is. Got it. Thank you for that. Thank you for your question. Uh, just a few minutes left. We're going to try to get to as many as we can from Lori. Two recent biopsies indicated rectal neuroendocrine, possibly two tumors. What's the best way to ascertain if there are actually two tumors or just one big tumor? Well, uh, some more investigating certainly would be in order. I would think a transrectal ultrasound would be a very sensitive way to look at things. Okay. Uh, one of the PET scans, either the gallium or the copper PET scan, would also be helpful to see if there's other locations. Uh, and a real good endoscopy, but sometimes the ultrasound through the scope can look through the wall of the bowel and look around in the near, nearby tissues to see is this one thing, is it two things, is it a bilobe dumbbell shaped thing, or is it two separate entities, or are there others that are you're unaware of that you don't see through the scope, but they could be on the other side of the wall. So you use sonar basically to tell us what's going on. Got it. Um, this is an interesting question from Jody. We've talked a lot today about uh, how the heart is involved or could be involved with this disease. Uh, and she asked, does a cardiologist generally sit on a multidisciplinary uh, board or meeting? Well, thank you, Jody. Um, we do have cardiology involved and we, we usually bring them in ad hoc when we need them, when we have cardiac related issues, especially if we're, if we're picking up you know, valvular problems uh, and things like that. And there we're trying to lay out a game plan for sequencing of what does this person need and in what order, what's the severity of valve disease, does it need to be addressed and have some valve work done before we do other things or do we do the other things first and then just keep the valve thing in abeyance just monitor it closely to see whether or not that progresses. So again, that's a case by case basis where, um, you know, if there's definitely if there are some cardiac issues and they're usually the first place to look would be something like a cardiac echo to see, get a good picture of the heart, see how the valves are working, that sort of thing. And then that'll let you know, OK, what's your next step ought to be. Got it. Thanks, Lori. Um, so Carrie has an interesting question. Do you believe in keep in do you believe keeping your liver clean with limited alcohol? We talked a lot about uh, li livers today as well. Healthy food. Does that make a difference in your opinion at, at keeping a disease at bay? And she says, I have uh, liver mets. Primary was in small bowel resection 10 years ago. Um, holding off on doing lanreotide as I do not have syndrome. So I'm trying to stay as healthy as possible. So there's nothing wrong with a healthy diet and a healthy lifestyle. As we say, all things in moderation. We have no evidence that says alcohol worsens or lessens the severity and aggressiveness of these tumors. We do know that alcohol can hurt the liver and can ultimately lead to cirrhosis in some cases. Uh, and so uh, it's a question of degree. Um, I will tell you though, that even the patients that are non-syndromic, we strongly recommend that they be on a somatostatin analog uh, to control their metastatic disease. We know for a fact that patients that are on somatostatin analogs have a longer time to progression probably have longer survival to a considerable degree than people who are not on those drugs, syndromic or non-syndromic. So that may be a question for your doctors to revisit. Uh, and just because a person does not have syndrome is not a reason not to be on a somatostatin. Got it. Absolutely. Well, folks, that is our time for today. I want to let you know, I've seen some questions in the comments. Uh, just know that you can refer back to this video. Uh, I saw someone asked about the recording it, uh, immediately. It's saved here on the Facebook page. Uh, as soon as this video is done, it takes a, a, a minute or two to process, and then it will be available under the videos tab. And then starting Monday, we will repost it 
and republish it to the YouTube channel for anyone you know that doesn't have Facebook so they can access it as well. And for those who have follow-up questions, because I know we covered a lot of ground today, uh, but it may have uh, presented some new questions that you have. So if you do, I highly recommend that you reach out to Carson Cancer Foundation after this here on the Facebook page or on their website, carsonoid.org. And they, I promise you, they will do their absolute best to get you uh, the direction you need or the, the answers to the questions uh, that you have. So I, I highly encourage you doing that. Dr. Boudreau, amazing session today. Thank you again a million Anytime. times for, for, for joining us uh, at last minute's notice. Uh, the people uh, will try to send you some of the comments. I, I uh, A lot of the people here at the end of the session were saying how how great and how informative it was, how much they learned. I, I as well. So uh, thank you so much for joining well, us today. We've, we view this this program, Nolan Nets, as a resource. It's all about helping patients. That's how we came to be and that's why we're here. 866-91-ZEBRA is the number. 866-91-ZEBRA to get your questions answered. We hope we can help. That's thank awesome. You for, thank you for having me this morning. I'm glad I was able to kind of shake absolutely. loose and spend some time with you, and I'm looking forward to doing it again. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And thanks for the kind words. And thank you all at home for joining us. As always, we hope the program helped answer some of your questions. Again, reach out to Carson and Kansas Foundation if they can help you further. Thanks, as always, to our presenting sponsor, Tercera Therapeutics. Without them, we couldn't do this program. Folks, my name is Rain Bennett. I have been your host. Thank you for watching. Please join us next time on Luncheon with the Experts. Stay healthy, stay safe, everybody. And stay warm. And stay warm. Bye-bye now.